And I tell you, Jesus is the gateway to all things. Healings, miracle, life, encounter. So just see Jesus right now. We're going to pray. God, right now we dedicate this house to you. These four walls, God, every human in this place, even through media, we say your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Release experience, encounter like never before, God. Divine intimacy, transformation all through this place. Angels ascending and descending. Glorify Jesus like never before. All for your glory in Jesus' name. Just give God a hand. Let's jump into praise. Now, are you ready to praise Him? Come on, are you ready to praise Him? I want to teach you a chorus to this song. The song says, grace, grace comes like a wave crashing over me. Grace comes like a wave crashing over and over and over. All right, it goes like this. Let's get high. Grace comes like a wave crashing over me. Grace comes like a wave crashing over Real simple. Grace comes a lot away, crashing over me. Grace comes a lot away, crashing over and over. All the ladies sing it. Come on, say it. Sing it out. Come on, say it. Grace comes like a wave. Come on. Crashing over me. Grace comes like a wave. Crashing over me. Now everybody together, sing it together. Say it. Grace comes like a wave. Crashing over me. Grace comes like a wave. Crashing over me. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on. Put your hands together like that. You brought me to the water where my past can be swept away. Your mercy, and I know I'll never be the same. There's no limit to your promise, Jesus. You have done it all for me, Jesus. You have done it all for me. Are you ready? Come on, that's it, that's it, that's it. Let's go tonight.
You make us alive. You call us out of the grave and into your light. The life we're living is in response to the life that you gave us. We say yes. We say yes. We say yes. Come on, it's one of the greatest words in the vocabulary of a worshiper. Somebody say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.
Turn your hearts to him as we declare this truth together. Are you ready? Are you ready?
been waiting for this for a day and a half. All you gotta do is love him now. That's all you have to do is just love him.
best we can right now. We just want you to know we love you. Holy Spirit, help us love Jesus more because he deserves it. He deserves it. And you love him so much. So catch us up tonight in that love. And don't leave a single hungry heart empty. You promised to fill us you said if we hungered, you'd fill us. You said if we were thirsty, you'd give us water to drink. 
you said we'd never thirst again. So here we are, touch us tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Look, not out of religion, but because you believe what we just prayed, I want you to say amen and lift a shout of praise and seal it. Come on, can you do that? Jesus. driving over here we said we've had the flood tides rising it's been rising but I'm waiting to hit that seam and we hit that seam thank you Jesus I was telling Bishop and Pastor Kathy I feel the water table rising slowly but surely we need to hit that pocket and we just did thank you Jesus let's stay there amen could I have that yeah the, the paper and the, the book please Thank you so much. You're in for a treat tonight. Pastor John Arnott is with us. Can we let him know we love him? <laughs> wow. Thank you, guys. We love you. Can we let them know how grateful we are? Wow. Amazing. 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 Well, how has this been so far? Wow. We're just getting started. We're just getting started. How was that panel this afternoon? Yeah. Where were the rest of you? What were you doing? You're like working. So were we. <laughs> it was so powerful. My word. I mean, Bishop Thomas, your message was phenomenal. So anointed full of the presence of the Holy Spirit, full of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wow. And Bishop Reed, you just made me want to like tackle the world. And we left feeling like we could do it. Just love you so much, Bishop. Incredible. That panel was holy. And for those of you who weren't able to make it, um, you can watch that on our YouTube channel. You can check it out on my Facebook. You can go to Michael Culianos. It's a shameless plug. You can follow that or just go to Jesus Image and check it out. But I would recommend that you watch that. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel. This entire event will be on free of charge. And it's just, I'm telling you, you know, I grew up, I, I remember Jessica's grandfather, Roy Harthen. Where's Jess? She got translated? Oh. And Jessica walked with God and was no more. Oh, I wouldn't like that. But uh, Jessica's grandfather, Roy Harthorn, used to tell us stories. I feel the Lord, man. This is a difficult uh, open and uh, announcement here. He would tell us stories about being at a meeting with Lester Summerall, the Jeffrey brothers, and Smith when he was a little kid, Smith Wigglesworth. And I said, what did you do? He said, I sat on the floor and listened. And that's what I felt like today. You know, people become much more uh, famous and more general-like once they go on to be with the Lord. There's a mystique that, that they seem to carry once they go on to be with the Lord. And the trap is not to recognize them while they're with us. And this morning, we had a, just a treasure. My Lord. My Lord. Amazing. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., Lou Engel will be here. So, you probably want to wear a helmet with a face guard. And hearing Lou, or being with Lou, is like having a flamethrower in your face from point blank range for an hour. But you'll be set on fire with a passion for revival. And I want to recommend, look, if you have not registered for the whole event, you can get a day pass out front uh, at our booth. Um, 
with, with uh, somebody's out there and you're able to sign up for uh, a day pass tomorrow. Tomorrow night, I'll be ministering. It'll be impartation night. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. And um, yeah, super, super honored. I want to thank Bishop and Pastor Kathy for having us again. How we love you. Would everyone please honor them and just thank them for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for loving the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Um, tomorrow we have a luncheon. I think we have about 58 spots remaining. And I just wanted to kind of let you in on that. It is free of charge, but here's the deal. What it is not is a feeding. We do do <laughs> feedings, and we believe on that. But this is a luncheon for those who feel like you would like to hear the vision of Jesus' image. What is on our heart for America, for revival, for the move of the Holy Spirit in the nations. It's a chance for you to hear from Jessica and I our hearts uh, and really cast a very clear vision for what we believe uh, God wants to do. I want to share it right now, but I just, I just can't. But it's super, super, super exciting. And it, uh, it may uh, be of interest to a lot of you to get on down to Florida. Let's just put it that way. But God is doing some awesome stuff down there. So tomorrow that is at, what time is that, Brittany? 12.30. And that is across the street in the youth center. And so if you'd like to come, you need to sign up. And if you did sign up already and you thought it was a feeding, then we have Jesus Image Erasers. And what you can do <laughs> is erase your name and, uh, and uh, leave room for somebody else, okay? Jesus loves you and so do we. Um, I just came out with a new book called Holy Spirit. And I'm really excited about it. Bill Johnson wrote the foreword. The subtitle is The One Who Makes Jesus Real. And how true that is. The Holy Spirit is the greatest evangelist in the universe. And his greatest pleasure is to tell us about Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'd like to see where some of you came from. How many of you are from the vital, revival, catalytic state of Ohio? Let me hear you stand. Would you stand up? Wow, look at all of you, all of the Buckeyes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. You can go ahead and sit down. You know, when you do this in Texas, it's almost like a cult. It's like a cult following. How many of you came from outside of the state? Raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Pastor John definitely did. Where'd you two come from? Pittsburgh. Oh, that's sort of out of state. But so, out of state. Yeah. so cool. Uh, let me hear it. Canada? You came in from Canada. Wow, thank you, Jesus. You know, that's not a state. That's actually a sovereign nation. I'm going to get to that in a moment. New York, Niagara Falls. I love Niagara Falls. Wait, hold on, hold on. Virginia. How about this group over here? I just heard it. Colorado, <laughs> California, where else? Il Illinois, Michigan, Florida. That's my posse right there from the Answer Church. Where? Buffalo. Buffalo. Wow. I didn't know that that's the first city Thomas Edison electrified. I just found that out today from Amy. Pretty amazing. Texas doesn't count. Doesn't count. <laughs> How many of you came from out of the country? Incredible. Where'd you come from? Okay, we'll count that. We love Mon I love Montreal. Amazing place. Where'd you come from? England. Wow. Incredible. You're hungry for Jesus. You're hungry, huh? Wow. Who else came from out of the country? Yeah, where'd you come from? That's Abby, Abby McCaskill, stand up. Abby was at Bethel for years, and she's a good friend. We love you, Abby. Thanks for being here. Anyone else from out of the country? How about it, Bishop? They're flying from out of the country to come to Youngstown. 
It's the anointing, it's the anointing and handles. I guess the two are synonymous since handles is anointed. Right? And uh, Dennis, it's good to have you here. Dennis, would you stand up? Dennis Shear led a great move of God in Buffalo under Pastor Tommy Reed. So awesome. And I want to thank all of the VCC staff and volunteers, the team bishop. Thank you so much to Emma and the entire crew and uh, all of the security who are getting touched with signs and wonders. This is just out of hand. It's so, so, so wonderful. Our, our team will be there. Uh, Jesus Culture will be there leading worship. Leland will be there. Um, upper Room Worship will be there. It's just going to be a big Super Bowl bonanza there in the Sunshine State. I'd like to also thank and welcome everybody watching from TCT. We love you. I love the Koontz family. They've been friends of ours for years. And look, if you're watching by television, I want to encourage you, please support TCT. It's an awesome ministry reaching the world. Well, I'm extremely honored tonight to, to uh, finally get to the moment that I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, Pastor John Arnott has been a friend of our family since the early 70s, Pastor John. And, um, and uh, obviously the whole world has been touched through the Toronto blessing. And He's carrying something that we need, which I believe is breakthrough in the Holy Spirit. And this region will never be the same after tonight. I said this region will never be the same after tonight. And we, we will never be the same after tonight. Amen? So I'm asking all of you to please stand and welcome Pastor John Arnott to Jesus Conference, Ohio. Thank you. joy to be here with all of you. My goodness. The crowd has grown significantly, I think. That the <laughs> Once we got into Friday night, so welcome to all the ones that are just joining us here. This is amazing. And uh, I think I'm especially thankful for the honoring and the presence of the Holy Spirit, who's with us here. Can we just kind of open your heart to him and open your hands to him even and uh, just invite him to come and minister to you tonight. Say something like, Holy Spirit, I would really love it if you just caught up with me and revolutionized me all over again on the inside because we recognize that our nations need a massive move of the Spirit of God to bring them to Christ and bring them into 
health and wholeness in all that he brings. So we need you tonight, Holy Spirit. We need you tonight, Lord Jesus. We need you tonight, Abba, Father. <sighs> For all the good things you want to do. been enjoying meeting many of you, and uh, it's always good to meet new friends in the anointing, isn't it? And yeah. It's just so precious. Carol and I were here a few years ago, I don't know, three or four, and I met Bishop and Kathy, and just there was a heart connection back then, and we were having it again, just such a delight reconnect with them. But we didn't come here just to make friends, did we? What did you come for? How many want more of him? Just more of him. And the funny part of that is that so we can talk about it and we can pray for it and we can want it and everything else, but in actual fact, you can't you can't really do it. It's something that that he does. But I hasten to say he's very faithful about it. But it always puts me on the edge, you know, like, Lord, are, are you going to come again in a special way to change hearts and change lives? And uh, by faith, the answer is yes. But I always love it when it's backed up with a whole string of really good testimonies about yeah. what happened to people. How many have a story uh, about how the Holy Spirit got a hold of you one day and everything changed? Just give heaven away right here. <laughs> I, I shared a little bit about what happened to us, we, we came through a, a series of, of wonderful relationships, you know, getting, to, getting born again in a Billy Graham crusade for me, and then from there, finding out from Pentecostals there was more, and then hearing about Catherine Kuhlman, and you know, just what an honor to be in the town where she had church every Sunday. I mean, this is a special place right here. But two dear friends of mine got empowered in her meetings, uh, being <coughs> Bill Prankard, who you probably haven't heard of, but yeah. Bill's like an undiscovered treasure of supernatural miracles, you know, uh, because he spends most of his time going to the Arctic and the Eskimos and northern Russia and everything else, because anyway, so there's Bill and then Benny Hinn. And, and it brought the whole thing a lot closer to us. And we began to encounter uh, the experiences of the Holy Spirit and the testimonies of what was happening. And, and then we found out about the ministry of John Wimber and that just helped tremendously from, from realizing that, listen, this is not just for the special people who were set apart from before they were born. This is for every Christian to get in on this thing. And see, my mother hadn't told me about the angels that had said to her that I was going to be in full-time ministry and all that one day. But you, you get that. That's tongue-in-cheek. She never had that experience. So I was content to just be a businessman or whatever and be supportive, even though I went three years to Bible school and tried to get myself ready. But um, we, we came back from a mission trip, Carol and I, and had specific instructions from the Lord to start a charismatic church in her hometown, Stratford, Ontario. It's an hour and a half west of Toronto, which we did that. And... Uh, we heard about revival in Argentina. We went there with Ed Silvoso. But let me back up a bit. 
the, the things we learned planting our church, I don't know how else you can learn them by just get in there and make your own mistakes and, and have a go. How many here would love to pastor a church one day? One. How many would like to? How many would like to plant or begin a new church or a new ministry somewhere? You see, we're a little tentative. We think we would, but how do you get started? And that's what I didn't know. But I'd led enough home groups and everything else that I just said, "All right, well, we're going to go for it then." But it won't be like a Wednesday night kind of thing. It's going to be Sunday morning. I want to know who's with us. And so we went there and we gathered like, I don't know, 35 people or something on the first Sunday in somebody's house. And away we went and we started winning all these young people. But see, I could not seem to, I couldn't get them, uh, it was difficult discipling them. I'd be, come on, you read the Bible, you know what it says. What's the problem? Let's just do what it says. <laughs> and I found out that very often the, the, the wounds in the heart are so deep that self-discipline in and of itself is not going to cut it. Now, we all need self-discipline. That's what <laughs> discipleship is. But that introduced us to uh, inner healing or healing of the heart. And one more component we got was a revelation of the Father's love. And we discovered that one of the fundamental things, problems with most people, including myself, was that they don't really know how much God loves them. And so they've been to church and they, they have performance put on them. Come on, do what it says. But, but it's, it's, it's a duty, it's a, it's, it's a push, you know. And, and so when we had a guy named Jack Winter come and teach us about the Father's love, it was just revolutionizing. Because, see, love is not something that is taught only. There has to be an encounter and an and impartation of that heart to heart. Amen. Remember that verse where Jesus said, um, no one really knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And then he said, and... The one to who the Son chooses to reveal him. I don't know why I'd missed that. I'd read the Bible so much, but I just never got that bit. Because, see, I would have said the love of God was like, a, like a, a doctrine, a fundamental doctrine. But I didn't know it was the fundamental doctrine. In fact, if you said, you know, all the different teachings in the Bible, you can write a book on each one, but actually the love of God is the shelf that all the books would sit on. It's fundamental. I had a friend one time say, John, did you know there was something more profound in our Christian faith than the cross? So I said to him, oh, really? What would that be, Jack? And he said, that would be the love of God. I said, okay, where do you get it? He said, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his son in the cross habit. And so we, we through the 80s, as we developed our church, we, we learned about having this encounter, revelation of the Father's love, and then the <laughs> healing, because see, you become secure in it a little bit, and it, it frees you up so that now you can admit that maybe there's one or two things the matter with you that you need to get healed up and repent of. But prior to that, you know, you're protecting and you're, you know, push back. What do you mean there's something wrong with me? Who are you to judge me? That kind of stuff. And so we were, we were really doing well with everybody's a part of this. Let's all get our hearts healed up. Let's have a revelation of the Father's love. Let's go signs, wonders, and miracles, and all of that. And Carol and I, in summer of uh, 1992, went to a Benny Hinn meeting, reconnected with him. And, uh, you know, we saw the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. It was just a fantastic night of worship and miracles. 
And then uh, he invited us into the green room after the meeting, and we, we went in, Carol, myself, and another friend, Kim DuPont. And as we walked through the door, he's still under the anointing, still bristling in it. And he lunges at us. He says, the spirit is on you, you know. And boom, 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 we're all down on the floor. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I, I recover because I'm, I'm not one who's particularly susceptible. Is that the right term? I wish I was, but Carol, on the other hand, you know, it, it used to be that if Benny was anywhere near her, she would be the first one to fall. I'd tell her, she's like my canary in the coal mine, you know, the, <laughs> the gas is around anywhere. You know, she's at the first one out. <laughs> and so, but she got absolutely, completely blasted by the Holy Spirit. And uh, I carried her to the car. And, <laughs> but I'm saying, baby, just stay under it. Don't try and get it together. This is what we want. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is what puts it all together, actually. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. We have to have this. So don't try and get it together. I'll get you home. Don't worry. We stayed with a friend in, in uh, Brampton, Ontario that night. And she just shook and buzzed the entire night. And we said, God, we have to have this. Amen. And so he spoke back to me and he said, right, if you want this, I'll give you two things to do. Number one, I want your mornings in prayer. Number two, spend time with anointed men and women. It seemed like, how are we going to do that? We've got, at that time, or by this point in time, we're running two churches. We had one in Stratford, one in Toronto. We would do them in the morning, drive to Toronto, do them in the afternoon. And uh, we only had a couple of staff. And, uh, but we said yes. What'd you do? Well, we. We started reading devotional books. Andrew Murray is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, he's one where you, you read you read a couple of lines and then you cry for a while and you repent and then you read a couple more. And, you know, it goes like that. We read Good Morning, Holy Spirit. We'd worship together. We'd read the Bible together. We'd, and the next thing you know, two, three, four hours have gone by. And, and we had well over a year of that. And... <laughs> But November of 93, we had an opportunity to go to Argentina with all this in the background now, hungering and thirsting after more of him. And you know, when you get into that mode, which I'm very much looking forward to getting back into in this next few weeks, uh, you, you, it becomes easier and easier, and your heart is longing for those days when Ah, you can just get unbusy and get in the presence of God and worship him and pray and love him and cry before him. I haven't, haven't had him spoke, uh, he spoke so many wonderful, intimate things into my heart in that season. Anyway, we wanted to see the revival in Argentina. We went there, and it was great, and transformed prisons, transformed cities. I mean, just it was just so hot and so electric what was going on. But there was a bit of an add-on in the program where Claudio Friesen held a meeting for us and he prayed for all the, all the Westerners and stuff. And uh, you know, people were just getting absolutely overwhelmed by the touch of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Carol, of course, was completely legless. Um, <laughs> I had to carry her home, literally that time, get her on the bus, then take her to the hotel, two nights in a row. But anyway, he, he, he prayed for me. But you know, sometimes when people are rough, you, it's kind of, you're trying to work out, was, was that the Holy Spirit or did I just get pushed over or what happened here? How many have ever been pushed over before? See, was it helpful? 
<laughs> now see, where it gets confusing is when, when people in their exuberance, okay, they push you over, but the anointing was really on it anyway. And so I'm kind of getting up on my knees thinking, God, you know, I come all this way, I want the really, really want you, but, you know, just help me here, Lord. And Claudia wheeled around, and he, and, he, and he says to me, do you want it? So I said, oh, yeah, I want it all right. Yes, I want it. But inside I'm thinking, why do you think I, you know, ran it up on our credit card, threw all this, flew all this way down here, and, you know, yeah, of course I want it. How many want it tonight? So when we say want it, we really mean we want him to come and. So he said uh, three words that changed my life. Then take it. And I had this moment where I, I realized that there, there, there needs to be a proactive part to us receiving the Holy Spirit. You can't just be passive. You see, I, I've had a lot of wonderful people pray for me. And Benny Hinn has prayed for me, I don't know how many times, trying his best to impart something to him, to me. And I'm like a, you know, an oak tree or something. And so, but it was because, it, see, if you remain passive, you're just kind of there, well, you know, I can't make it happen, so over to you, God, if you want to do it, then here I am, you know, kind of thing. But see, the, there needs to be a reaching out yes. from us. Yes. And I, I had a moment where I realized that I, I needed to reach for it then. It's right there. You, if you want it, you're going to reach for it. Take it. So I reached out in the spirit somehow, in some way I find it difficult to explain, but I took a hold of that, and in my heart there was like a click of faith and a click of the spirit just, and I knew something had changed. And so we went home full of expectation, and uh, Carol led two people to Christ on the airplane. It's never happened before or since. Not like that. And uh, we went right to a conference, a, a leaders conference that we were part of, and we heard about another guy, Randy Clark, who had been similarly touched in a Rodney Howard Brown meeting. And I knew Randy casually, and I called him up and said, I want you to come. I hear something happened. Uh, how soon can you come? And, and he's like, well, gosh, John, it only happened once. And I've never been out of the country. You want me to go to Canada? And, and you know, so it's just two people trying to, trying to rev up a little bit so they could go for it. And Randy came, and we were both so tentative. But he told his story, and then he said, if you, if you would like prayer, uh, I'm happy to pray for you, so just come on up. Everything had been totally uh, pretty much normal up to that point. It was crackling in the air a bit, but but pretty normal up to that point. And but when people went to get out of their chairs, that's when it was like heaven opened and the Holy Spirit fell on that group of people. About not a not a large group on a Thursday night, about 130 of us, and it just exploded in the room with people falling, laughing, shaking, yelling, crying, and, and carrying on like that. I mean, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what just happened here? And that was our beginning. And I learned what it meant when in the, in the Bible when it says the Holy Spirit fell on us. See, when he falls on you, it's, it's not imperceptible. It's like a a piano fell on you, or an <laughs> elephant fell on you. There wasn't personal injury, generally, but still, you can't get up. And we were inundated with all these various manifestations of the spirit that I just had no grid for. 
And uh, that could be your story right now. You just think, well, I want more of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want all that baggage that those guys in Toronto have, you know, like I don't want the, I don't want the out of control stuff. And uh, you, you may have, quite, how many have questions about manifestations still? Anybody? Honestly, I mean, just, we all did, I certainly did. And you, you wanna know what it's, what it's all about. And so what, 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 you, what you need to conclude, I think, is this. That if God is going to touch you, how many want God to touch you? All right, if God's gonna touch you, the miracle is that you live through that. <laughs> right, because we're, we're talking about the one who said, let there be light, and <laughs> the sun exploded into reality. And uh, a whole bunch of stars just popped up, and <laughs> our sun is small compared to most of the other ones, you know. If he's going to touch you, the miracle is that you live through it. So where did we get the idea that, well, we can take it or leave it, uh, you know? And I traced it back to what I would now call a false teaching that went something like this. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He will never force you to do anything against your will. Now who came up with that? Let's see. Zachariah. The father of John the Baptist couldn't, couldn't talk for nine months because of the anointing, yeah? The apostle Paul was blinded for three days because he had a divine encounter. Uh, all kinds of fantastic things. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is shaking so bad, there's no strength in him. The angel has to strengthen him, the angel of the Lord so that he can stand up on his feet and, and he just wiped him out for days after that. See, we're talking about the power of God coming upon you. And he always comes for good. He always comes to glorify Jesus. But, but the manifestations are just, for the most part, our reaction to power going through us. Power that is debilitating many times. And I want to talk to you tonight about wanting more of the Holy Spirit. How many want more? Now what if it, what if it blows your fuses? <laughs> and trips your circuits? And uh, what if your mother doesn't understand? Or your friends. But see, we need something that's not just going to inch us along forward a little bit. We need something that's going to blast us into full on revival that is going to be nation shaking and earth -shaking. That's what we need. And so, in the context of the kingdom of God, we have the wonderful promise of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, um, would it be would it be hard to get that pulpit down here? That'd be probably make it easier. If we go to Matthew chapter three, we see John the Baptist introducing the concept of the kingdom of God, and uh, he's saying, "Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand." And so, what you want to do is you've been going your own way. Stop, turn around, and go toward God because. God's kingdom is at hand. God's kingdom is within your reach. And I think that's important. It's within your reach, meaning you can have it, but you, you, you're, there's a reach of faith there that you've got to reach for it. And he points out further on in that same chapter that um, he's the one who baptizes with water but one coming after him is not worthy to undo his sandals. 
He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And there's a holiness purge that goes with it as you read the next verse. And see, I, I want us together to take another look at the baptism in the Holy Spirit because, you see, we, we've made, some of us have tended to say, well, I, I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit back in the day. I spoke in other tongues and it was really great. And yes, I'm sure it empowered me. But off we go now onto a more of a disciplined Christian life full of the, the outward focus and, and, and lots and lots of striving and hard work made. So as we come back and consider this word, uh, baptize, you need to know the word means immerse. How many knew that? But we kind of have that understanding in terms of water baptism, maybe, and, which is the reason the translators left it in Greek, because they didn't want to confuse the, so a lot of the church doctrines about what happens when you're baptized and on and on and on. So, they just left it as an untranslated Greek word, uh, bap baptizo, baptizoma. But the word means to immerse, right? Yep. And so he's saying, I immerse you in water, but the one coming after me, <laughs> he's going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. And to immerse is different than dip. The Greek word for dip is bapto. That's kind of in and out. But baptizo means put you in and keep you in for a little while. We used to have a, a whole story about some ancient recipe for making pickles that immerse. How many have heard that story? A few of you have. Well, it was. It was a Greek recipe for making pickles. And what you do is you, how many have ever, ever made them before? So you take the cucumbers, the raw cucumbers, and you blanch them, they call it. You put them in boiling water to sterilize them, I think. And then, uh, so that's the dip. You dip them in and out of that hot water, but then you immerse them in the pickling solution. And that's where they use the word bapto to baptizo. And so now you're immersed in that pickling solution for whatever the recipe called for, like two weeks or a month or whatever. And a transformation happened to that little cucumber. It's no longer a raw vegetable. Now it tastes like the pickling solution. When you get properly pickled in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You're not going to have the raw taste so much anymore. You're going to taste like him. And he wants to immerse you in his presence. Now, there's a whole lot I could say about the kingdom, really. The, the kingdom of God has always existed. Uh, there never was a time when God didn't exist, uh, but uh, he's invading a fallen planet and, and, and coming down and wanting to take it over. And so the, the kingdom uh, was enhanced strongly by John the Baptist and, and much more so by Jesus himself. And so he would say the kingdom is here. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom's within reach. And we would say, yes, it's here, but not yet in all its fullness. So that day is yet to come, but it is here in a strong measure. And it's out there for you and I. And so we say, yeah, the kingdom's coming in all its fullness. The king will return one day. It's going to be amazing. But meanwhile, we have access to the kingdom now. Tell somebody near you, the kingdom's within your reach. The rule and reign of God, or the dominion of God, is within your reach. And so we see Jesus in John chapter 4 preaching the same kind of message. After he goes through his testing in the wilderness, he comes back out and, uh, and he begins to preach that 
the, uh, in verse 17, repent, turn around, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there begins a journey with his promise that he's going to immerse us in the Holy Spirit. Now I want to break this down into two parts. There's the inbreaking of the kingdom where the Holy Spirit sort of comes from out there and finds you and, 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 you, and you get filled and, and, and gifts flow in and bad stuff comes out and good stuff goes, goes in and it's revolutionizing for you and the kingdom broke in on your life. But then there's another part where the kingdom is within you. And so now there's a fountain bubbling up on the inside of you. And so it's, it's, it's easier access now because you're, you're carrying it around with you. And so let's look at some of this. The, uh, the impartation that happened in Matthew 10, uh, this, this is a model for all of us. Now, I think it's important to note that Jesus... When he came to earth as a man, he emptied himself. It's as though he set his divinity to one side. Now hear me carefully on this. He's always forever the, 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 the God the Son, okay? But he chose to put on humanity. And if you read it in Philippians chapter 2, though he were God, he didn't think his divinity was something he had to hold on tight to. He was willing to go to earth as a man, but a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And so at the moment of conception, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's, he grows and he's born, of course, and lives his life up to about 30 years of age. But then when he's baptized by John and heaven opens, he who is filled with the Holy Spirit gets another impartation now and he's different after that and mighty signs and wonders immediately uh, start happening as he returns in the power of the spirit but see everything Jesus did was as a man filled with the Holy Spirit so that he could be a model for you and I now that doesn't take away from his divinity ever. He could have at any moment said, enough of this, you know, call it off. I'm, I'm, I'm taking my divinity hat back right now type of thing. I mean, that was, that was his choice, but he chose to set it aside temporarily so he could rescue a fallen planet and he could pass that same anointing on to you and I because we would use him as a model. And it's amazing how, how theologians through the years have sort of discounted Jesus as a model because after all, he's, he's God, so we shouldn't be surprised that he's healing the sick. But nevertheless, don't think that you can do that because you're not divine. Well, actually... You and I can do this the very same way Jesus did because it's the Holy Spirit filling you and moving through you that does the supernatural work exactly like what happened with him. See? And so if we go over to the very end of Matthew 19, I'm sorry, Matthew 9, and at the end of those verses, it says how, in verse 35, Jesus went about all the city's villages, teaching the synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We have a laborer problem. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now realize in the original text, there's no chapters and divisions. It goes right into the next part of the story. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them something. And so his ministry had become so popular and spectacular that it's 
way beyond one person being able to minister to the crowd. And these people are all milling around like sheep without a shepherd. What do you think's wrong with them? See, when you read these stories, put yourself in the story, start to say, like, what, what would it have been like to be there? And you realize people had carried their poor sick mother for, you know, miles maybe, and they, we, if we can just get to him and touch the hem of his garment, she'll be well and all this kind of stuff. And they got there and there's thousands ahead of them and it's already getting dark. And what are we going to do? And they're all milling around like, ah, we can't get to him. And he sees that. And he knows it's time to multiply. So he calls the 12 and he gave them something. And in Matthew's gospel, he gives them exousia. He gives them authority. I realize that King James is power, but to be more specific, the word is exousia. If you read the same passage in Luke chapter 9, you'll find he gave them two things, power and authority. And then he sent them out. He's multiplying his ministry and sending them out. Notice their instructions. Only go to the house of Israel initially. Verse 7, as you go, preach, make an announcement. Tell them what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hey, the kingdom is at hand. That means you can have it. It's available for you. Anybody interested? By the way, there's no sickness in heaven. There's no poverty in heaven. There's no shame or pain or fear or abandonment or all that. There, there's bliss. There's joy. There's bountifulness. I mean, it's healing. That's your announcement. Tell them that and then demonstrate. And listen, look at it. Heal the sick, verse 8. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely receive, freely give. You know, when, when I really began to understand that verse, I was wishing he'd left raise the dead off that list. Because, <laughs> see, this is a beginner's list for these guys. They, they, they'd never done this before. They'd seen him do it. But after all, he's pretty special, isn't he? The Messiah, the anointed one. But no, raise the dead's on the list. And off they go. And then he doesn't stop there. We, we get over into Luke uh, 9 and 10, and we see that he sends 70 others out even less trained than the 12, by the way. And, and same thing. Freely have received, freely give. So it's a pretty simple mission. And I think it's for us to do today. So here's, here's the deal. You proclaim the kingdom is within reach. And then you demonstrate the kingdom by healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, and casting out demons. Isn't that simple? Yeah. Everybody understand what to do? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> so see, here's the point. That impartation that he gave them is vital. Because we all know you just, you just can't do this stuff in any kind of a sort of a gung-ho bravado or something. There, there has to be power that backs this up. There has to be spiritual authority that backs this up. Impartation. The kingdom broke in on those gods. Once again, after the resurrection, in John chapter 20, verse 22, he, he breathed on them. And um, what did that look like? He said, receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy breath. Have you ever seen your dad blow on people? He took so much heat for it, he kind of backed off on it. He's doing it again. 
grave. Because there's something on that. See, the word for, for, for spirit, pneuma, means breath or wind or spirit. And so it's anointed breath. You, you blow that on people, it's just every bit as effective as laying on of hands sometimes. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage you don't settle on a method. But just be open to at least the things that are in the scriptures. And G G Jesus <laughs> blew on them. And they received something. It was, it was amazing. How many would like resurrected Jesus to blow on you and say, receive the Holy Spirit? Boy, I sure would. Well, uh, let's go over to Acts chapter 1 and 2. And um, what we see is he's about to leave. You know, you put yourself in this story, and it's amazing how, you know, he, he no sooner got raised from the dead, and then he announces, I'm going away. I can just imagine that roller coaster ride, you know, like they left everything to follow him, and they're kind of like, hey, we're in on the ground floor, and his kingdom is coming for sure. This is amazing. And then he starts saying the, the Son of Man is going to be crucified. And, and his life is going to be taken from him. And then he says, but no one takes my life from me. I lay it down to myself. And if I lay it down, I'll take it up again. So I'm going to be raised up. But they're like, no way. This can't happen. But sure enough, before the rise, he's taken and crucified six hours on the cross. He's, he died and he's buried. And they're devastated. And they can't hardly believe it when the word goes out. He's risen, as he said. And then he starts appearing into the room and uh, here and there and appearing. And they're just, they're just settling. You know, it's true. The Lord's back. And then he starts telling them, guys, I'm going to be going away. Why are you so sad? You should be happy for me. I told you, I'm going to the Father. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I guess. And... <laughs> But it's in, in, in John 15, he tells them, listen, it's expedient for you that I go. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will not come to you in the way that I want him to. You've kind of been working as an extension of my anointing up to this point. But I want you to have the full on impartation, filling, immersion of the Holy Spirit. So I need to go away. Now, I don't get it all, but, you know, in terms of the Trinity, I just figured, okay, well, they don't want more than one away at any given time. So Jesus <laughs> goes back to heaven, and the Holy Spirit just comes to earth, okay? And so he has final words for them. <laughs> Acts 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them. How many are good with that? Have we got any ex-military people here in the room? Hands up. God bless you all. One or two or three of you. Well, we have such a high value on our individualism, most of us, that we don't really like to be commanded. What do you mean you command me to? But he said, he commanded them, do not leave the city. Wait for the promise of the Father. Can you take those kind of instructions? See, waiting on the Lord is a vital part of this. It determines how hungry you really are and how obedient, perhaps, you really are. Anyway, that's the promise. Wait for the promise of the Father, which you've heard of me. Verse 8, you shall receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, many things happen when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Uh, you know, there's many symbols for him. Let's see, water, river, rain, um, oil, wind, fire, clothing, many, and they all have significance. We're trying to describe what's going on. But the water is speaking, I think, of, of cleansing. The wind is speaking of 
movement and propulsion. And the oil, speaking of healing and, of course, anointing, which is what the word means. And fire, of course, is contagious, and the Holy Spirit is extremely contagious. You know, Dennis came to Toronto. He got blasted by the Holy Spirit on, on the floor, and then went over to Buffalo and spread the fire all over Tommy Reach Church, didn't you? Contagious. Tell somebody next to you, this, this, be careful, this stuff is contagious. <laughs> yeah? So wait for the promise, and then in Acts 2, it happened, and this is a mighty day. Now see, talk about manifestations. Suddenly, there's a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, like a hurricane. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and sat on each of them. So just imagine this. Now, they're all in a room. Suddenly a hurricane sound is blowing around. They're wondering what's going on. And fire sitting on everybody's head. And they all erupt in languages they'd never learned. And they unlocked the doors. They were hiding up there afraid in the prayer meeting. They pour out into the street, start preaching the gospel in all these unlearned languages. And the whole town comes together in a crowded feast time for Jerusalem to, to see what is going on. And Peter says, no, no, these are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, God was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh and uh, it was gonna, it's going to change the world. All flesh are going to be touched by this thing. And so if you read the prophecy in Joel and then read Peter's spin on it, you're like, how did he get that? But anyway, it's, it's amazing how that mighty outpouring of the spirit came on those 120, and those people changed the world. Now think about this. Jesus had said to them, they're like, okay, well, when is, your, when is the kingdom? When is the kingdom coming? And, and he said, well, the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the nations, all the nations in the world, and then the end will come. You know, I, if I had been there, I'd have said, Lord, can I, can I just have a minute with you, like, all the nations, I mean, we're this tiny little group in Israel. And, and Israel doesn't like us, actually. How, how are we going to go from here to the whole world getting in on this thing? How's that going to happen? And he would have said, oh, that's, that's easy. By the Holy Spirit filling each and every one of us. That's how. And see, the, in Antioch, they began to call them Christians. Now, if I said to you, are you a Christian? How many would say, yeah? Do you ever think about what it means? What does it mean? Huh? To follow Christ. No, it doesn't mean that. I mean, we do follow him. Christ. -like. Little Christ. What does Christ mean? Anointed one. It's the same as the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah. So he is the Messiah. You're a little Messiah. How about that? I don't go around saying that because people are misunderstanding. You've got you to take it back into the English root. He is the anointed one. I am a little anointed one. But it's that anointing that's going to allow me to be persuasive when I share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so here we have where the Holy Spirit comes and breaks in on a crowd of people. And I love it when he does that. 
I think he's going to start it tonight, actually. We, we used to be in meetings, no kidding, where I'm trying to t teach them something profound, like, I don't know, hell is real, or offering time, or whatever. And he would, he would hijack the meeting, and everybody starts sliding out of their seats and laughing and, and carrying on. And, you know, we have a guy in our church who fixes any chairs that get broken. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not so bad anymore, but I asked him on our 20th anniversary, Cal, how many chairs do you reckon you've fixed over the years? He said, I don't know, five, six hundred of them? Maybe. So if you want revival, do not buy cheap chairs. <laughs> don't get the particle board base, you know. You need a really good plywood platform in there. Because, see, what happened is it would go off in the room like, like popcorn. People just fly up in the air and come back down. Sometimes it wasn't so high, but sometimes they would be like five feet up and down. And it was like, boom, 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 all over the room. And I'm just like, that's when you say, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing here. And I, I told them earlier, he spoke back to me, son. John, you don't even understand women. Why would you think you would understand me? So, I'm like, but see, he loves to hijack the meeting with the understanding, this, this is not my meeting. This is not, you mean, you guys would be the first to say, this, this is his meeting. We keep telling him that. You're the senior leader. We're just, we're just along for the fun. But it's, let him do what he wants to do. And, and so, just while we're there, don't let manifestations offend you. They're really just, 90% of the time, they are people's reaction to power, unimaginable power, going through their bodies. See, if you had two electric leads to hold, I said, hold these tight while I plug this in the wall. How many, how many think you might jump? Or shout? Or laugh? <laughs> or scream? That's merely electricity. We're talking about the power of God. You being immersed in this stuff. And so, 90% of it is people reacting to that power. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's amazing. I've seen people run backwards through the whole room, you know, jumping backwards over bodies that are strewn all everywhere. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we have our favorite ones. One, we were in Australia. The, the district AOG pastor was there, AOG district leader and his wife. She was all dressed to the nines, you know. He'd been to Sunderland, England. He, knew a bit about what it was like, but, but I think it was her first time, and she was sitting in the front row, and, and we had a whole bunch of precious people from the islands nearby, like Thursday Island and Tuesday Island and all of that, and they were the most spiritually sensitive people I think I've ever run across. I mean, you just look at them and they go flying. <laughs> so her eyes got wider and wider and wider, and I can just read her face. What kind of a madhouse have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and uh, if she knew it was God, but see, it doesn't compute. Why would God do this? Why would God do that? Why would the other? It can't be the devil, because they're testifying how it brought them closer to Jesus and all this stuff, or healed or whatever. But she's just, just getting, I don't know, blown away by it. And all of a sudden, she flew up in the air, did a complete somersault and landed in an empty seat three rows back. So, so I, I was a big high platform. I, I looked over at Carol and I'm like, <laughs> we were both shocked. 
does, he does amazing stuff. <laughs> and um, you say, well, why would God do that? Got me there. <laughs> I don't know. But he just loves doing things out of the ordinary. I mean, some people have been suspended like 12 inches off the floor. We, had, we have friends that are le leaders of ours in Norway, and uh, th this lady, one time we prayed for her, and uh, she was out for the entire meeting. In fact, it was a very full room, so she was in my way. I prayed for her, but she was out, and she was right <laughs> in the way. But, you know, we, we kind of, it, it, you know, it helps the, the ambiance of the meeting and everything if there's a few <laughs> bodies around. <laughs> I don't mind it. <laughs> but when it's time to go, uh, it's now like, I don't know, midnight or later. Her husband says, guys, I need some help. I cannot move her. So it took four sturdy guys struggling to lift this lady as stiff as a board. She, she's not a heavy lady, I would guess 110, 120 pounds baby. And, and they struggled to carry her and, and loaded her into the back of the van. <laughs> so they drive to the hotel and then they, they bring her into her room. So imagine you're going by the, the desk for <laughs> yeah, We're good, we're good, she's okay, no problem. No I got her in the room. So I was with them again uh, a year or so ago when I asked her this question. I said, uh, Uni, has, uh, has anything like that ever happened to you before? She said, yes, similar. First time I was in Toronto, um, I was out under the power, and I realized I, I couldn't move. I was just couldn't move. But after a while, I could sit up. So I would sit up, but my legs were like lead. I could not move my legs. Now, how many know the word uh, in Hebrew for glory is kabod? And it means heaviness, right? the weight. So the weight of God comes on you. And I'm telling you, it's, it's heavy. And I, I love that. I love I feel him on my hands right now, that weightiness. So you can feel him. You, get, you don't see him, but you can feel him. He's like electricity sometimes, like heat sometimes, like, like, like weight many times. So this weight is on her. And she kept trying to move, but she couldn't, so she'd lie back down. But she'd sit up and then lie down. So finally she sat up, and then it kicked in. She's like, up. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down. She said, John, I did sit-ups for one and a half hours. And I'm like, whoa, what were you like in the morning? She's like, absolutely no pain, no problem whatsoever. How many want one of those? See, these are... This is the, the packaging that goes sometimes with the infilling, the life-transforming infilling as the Holy Spirit breaks in upon you. And it's just fantastic. And it happened to the apostles in Acts 2. It happened again in Acts 4. The place was shaken. It happened in Cornelius' house again in Acts 10. And notice... While Peter is preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And in his words, he fell on them as he fell on us at the beginning. So a number of years had gone by. They were kind of getting used to things a little bit. But now the Lord says, it's time for the Gentiles to get in on this. And so Cornelius the angel comes, go get Peter. Peter comes back. Uh, you know, I'm not supposed to be here because Jews and Gentiles, whatever. But... God has told me, and so, boom, in the middle of his talk, the Holy Spirit hijacked the meeting, crashed in on them, just like he did in Acts chapter 2. Isn't that amazing? So, see, this is the in, 
breaking of the kingdom. Now, you can tune into that wherever you are, but can we be childlike a little bit with this? You know, when you, when you read, uh, what is it, Luke 10, where, where he's saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise guys and revealed them unto little children, for that was your good pleasure. Luke 10 and verse 21, actually. So when you think about this, Jesus, the greatest evangelist ever, is happy that his message is being <laughs> hidden and withheld from a group of people. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I, I love being an evangelist. A big part of what I do is seeing the lost one to Christ. And if I figured I'm missing the, that group, I would sort of try to tweak things to hit them as well, wouldn't you? But he's like, thank you, Father, that you've hidden it from the wise and learned, but you have revealed it to little children because that was your good pleasure. And so there's a, there's a, there's a message in there where, where, where we, we need to be less complicated and more childlike. Because what it, what it does is it, it causes unbelief to arise in your heart. So going back to the whole thing, God, what are you doing, what are you doing? See, we think that we should understand everything he's doing, and if I don't understand it, then I don't want it. Wrong. You'll miss all the fun if you do that. And we had to learn that how much fun he was. He's just playing with people sometimes. Why else would they be popping up like popcorn out of their uh, in Raleigh Church a couple of weeks ago, just the presence got thicker and thicker, and the one on the team, he's fighting at it first, but he jumped up out of his seat and went running around the whole room full speed, fast as he could, under the anointing. And then a uh, 65-year-old, one of the top businessmen in the church, the guy least likely to show any emotion, jumped to his feet and went running around the room after him as fast as his little legs would carry him. <laughs> Be careful back there. You're getting really, really full. <laughs> and so we realized that, hey, he's fun to be around. <laughs> Margaret Paloma has been a big help to me from the University of Akron, Ohio, just close by, and she sent me a thing of, uh, of the theology of play. Man, that was a helpful little, uh, little booklet. A theologian in Belgium or something had figured it all out. And, you know, he just loves to, you know, where, where do you th what does the fruit of joy look like when it gets going in the church? <laughs> well, we're, we're okay with with love. We're good with love, aren't we? How many want love's okay? And peace, okay, well we want more peace. Gentleness, yeah. But what about joy? What does that look like? Happy faces. How many want more joy? Tell your face. I want more joy. You know. Let it bubble up. So, so this is the kingdom breaking in on you. And that's what happened to us January 20, 1994, when Randy said, if you want to come up, I'll pray for you, all really low key. All of a sudden, people make their move. I think I'll go up and get prayer. And then the minute they did, he fell on us. And th the whole room exploded into an uproar. Our women's pastor, Mary Audrey Raycroft, is teaching a class in an adjoining room and she hears all this commotion. She keeps teaching, but it doesn't stop. So after a while, she says, what on earth are they doing in there? And so she says, I gotta go find out. So she opened the side door. Her first thought is, where is everybody? 
<laughs> See, because you're expecting a room full of people on their feet, hands in the air, and they're cheering and they're yelling and carrying on. But she's like, where is everybody? She realized they're under the chairs. They're between the rows. They're, they're in the aisles. And her mouth fell open. She's like, <gasps> and then, bam, she's right down on her face for 40 minutes. Can't move. And then she, when she finally got up, the second miracle happened. She could not talk. <laughs> she's, a, she's a talker. I mean, she just says, very articulate, couldn't talk. It was amazing. All right. Let's go to John 4. Now we have the kingdom that's within you, that's bubbling up within you. So Jesus, in the beginning of this chapter, um, he, he left Judea, verse 3, and departed again to Galilee. But this time he needed, he says, to go through Samaria. So instead of taking the long way over and up the Jordan Valley and into Galilee, he takes a shorter way through Samaria, which is the Samaritan territory. And he needed to do that for reasons that he doesn't really say, share. So he came to Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And therefore, Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour, 12 noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And then it's got this little verse next. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And I thought, that's odd that all of the disciples would go. I mean, why don't half you go and get food? The other guys just chill, stay with me, and we can talk through whatever, or at least one of you stay with. But they all go. Hey, I want to go into town too. All right, go, you go. This is Samaritan town. I don't care. Let's just go. And there he is alone. And this woman comes to draw water. And he asks her for a drink. And so she's like, huh, this is odd. A Jew passing through here is odd. A Jew speaking to a woman is odd. A Jew asking her for a drink, that is also odd. The woman says, how is it you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You know, the Samaritans are kind of like, I don't know, Jehovah's Witnesses or something. <laughs> they, had, they had part of it, but not quite right. Isn't that fair to say? <laughs> and... Uh, but, but he doesn't ans answer her question directly. He says this. Lady, if you knew two things. Number one, if you knew the gift of God. And number two, if you knew who it is who's speaking to you. You would ask him for a drink. And he'd give you a drink all right. He'd give you living water. And so she's like. What? Sir, you got nothing to draw with. The well's deep. Where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank himself and his sons and his livestock? He says to her, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And she says, okay, give, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. So she's trying to figure him out. Like, who, who is this? What is this guy? He's talking to me. He's a Jew. Like, is he hitting on me? Is he, like, what's he want? <laughs> and but his question stands, if you, if you knew two things, two things that 
I dare say everyone in this room knows. If you, you know, when you talk about the gift of God, you can break that down. First of all, it's Jesus as Savior. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But I think what he's referencing here is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The very thing promised in Acts chapter 1. Wait for the promise of the Father which you've heard from him. If you knew about that promise, and if you also knew the one who is speaking to you right now, you would ask him for living water, and he would give it to you, and you would never thirst again. Do you know why? Because it would become in you like a, an artesian well of water springing up over and over into eternal life. This is amazing. See, I read that verse many, many years, and I, I never really kind of understood it. Is it, if you drink the water I give you, you never thirst again. But I'd say, but Lord, I'm thirsty. I want more. I want more quantity. I want, I want more quality. I mean, I just want more of you, more of you. And I didn't really get the message. See, when you carry a well around with you, an everlasting supply of living water, there is no need for you to ever go thirsty again. All you have to do is plug in to that well within you and take a good big drink and quench your thirst. You see, the Holy Spirit is kind of like water as well. Yesterday's drink won't do for today. You need today's drink and you need this moment's drink. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. You know, great, you got filled yesterday. Hallelujah, wonderful. But now you need another drink today. But you know what? You carry a reservoir around with you. It's amazing. You know, we started out in a little wee church. It, 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 it was barely would hold 400. We had an overflow which would hold another uh, 300. But this is crammed in like sardines. We had to find a place. And we, we finally found where we are now, miracle story, but it was uh, on, on Atwell Drive in, in Toronto, again, on the other side of the airport. And it took me about two years or so for, for it to register that, wait a minute, our church is now located on Atwell Drive. <laughs> I'm like, well, duh, you're at the well now. <laughs> And so it became a well. I mean, thousands, millions came and drank deeply of, of, of living water. But see, this is supposed to be within you. So now it's not so much the inbreaking kingdom as it is you learning to draw on the kingdom that's within you already. Now you need both. You need the impartation and you need to learn how to drink and how to draw on that which is within you. See, because the kingdom is at hand, but it's also within you. Right? One last verse, John 7. Verse 27, I think it is, 30, 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Now here he is in the temple. It's the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles the big high day of that feast, and he stands up and shouts out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, he, she, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, I love the old King James, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit who those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. There's the promise. This, if you, if you knew the gift of God, and you know who, who is this promising this to you, you would ask him from your heart, sincerely. You would say something like, oh, Lord Jesus, May I please have this living water that I would never thirst again. 
And again, if you can be childlike with it, it's more likely to kick in. But why don't we stand for a moment? And uh, I, I just have a feeling that the kingdom is going to kind of go both ways. It's going to bubble up and crash in as well tonight, which would be wonderful. But see, there is there is a an artesian well within you, in your belly, in your inner being. And you can drink of him any time you've a mind to. You just kind of tune in to the Holy Spirit. You can take out your spiritual straw. You know, you put one end in your mouth. You put the other end, plug it into your belly button. Right? And then you can have a good big drink. Because, see, he lives in there, this Holy Spirit. Are you ready? Let's do it together, children. Wow, out of my inner being, living water flowing. Let's do it again, ready? Don't just leave it in the realm of imagination. I want you to realize we're talking about real stuff. You just don't see it. But you can feel it, and you can certainly feel the effects of it. We're talking about you drinking from that eternal supply of living water that you can access from within you. Right? How many want to do one more? <laughs> now we learned a little secret that if if you want to if you want to be used to pour out and minister to other people, first you got to get filled up because you can't give away what you've never first received. So so you just get really really good and full. And so. Hook up, and here we go. Ready? <sighs> now you can you can do that a few times, and now you can begin to give it away to other people because it's fiery. It's very very contagious. This person of God, the Holy Spirit, is is wonderfully contagious, and he loves to, to jump from one to the next to the next. It's just amazing how he does that. So, so lay hands on somebody near you, and if they're comfortable with that, if they're not, well, okay, leave them alone, but if they are, just say, let the river flow. See, because that was the promise from John 7. Out of your innermost being, rivers, plural, of living water will flow. This he spoke of the Spirit. All right, now just keep going with that, just for like five minutes. Or like just press in, take a good big drink. Draw on that well within you. And then pour it out. Give it away. Give it away. And just let that river flow. Come on, Holy Spirit. This is your meeting. This is what you love to do. Just let it come on them here. In Jesus' name, your fiery presence on them all. Flow, Holy Spirit. Flow, Holy Spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love what you do, Holy Spirit. 
I give you permission to just come and fill me with all the fullness of God. Keep drinking, friends, keep drinking. Now, if, if this is new to you, and we've already kind of gone beyond your comfort zone, just bear with me a little bit. I used to tell people, look, don't just go home and say that's it for that place. Stay with us about three days. It takes about three days to try to work it out that, hey, this is God. It goes, it goes like this. This can't be God. And then you, you, you see your friend get touched and you hear their story. And they, well, huh, maybe, maybe it is God. And then you go, this is God. And then it starts to get all over you and you, you're kind of drunk now. And you're like, this is God, you know. It's, it's wonderful to be immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's much more I could say, uh, but the Holy Spirit is your down payment on heaven. It's like the deposit. How do you know you're gonna like heaven when you get there? Well, it's gonna be filled with love, joy, peace, Patience, gentleness, meekness, blah, 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 blah. All nine get fruits of the Spirit. Oh, yes, and self-control. Huh, I'm glad you mentioned that one. Listen. The fruit of self-control is a strengthening so that you can control yourself. And it's in the context of dealing with sin. It was never intended for you to control the Holy Spirit and tell him what he should and shouldn't do in your life. Never. Otherwise, Paul never would have been blinded and Zachariah never would have been struck dumb. And yeah. I mean, think about what Jesus did. He walked on water. And it wasn't frozen. <laughs> That is pretty crazy, isn't it? I love that verse in John 14, verse 12. That's one that's up on my fridge or somewhere. It says this, truly, truly, I say to you. How many know when Jesus says that, that you need to listen up? <laughs> truly, truly, the one who believes in me, he or she who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. How many believe in Jesus? Give him a wave. I believe with all my heart, Lord. Okay, this means you then. This means you. The works that I do, you will do also. And even greater works than these you will do because he's going to the Father. Now see, we can't just endlessly talk about this stuff. You have to have interaction with it. You have to encounter it. You have to go away saying things like, I didn't think I was going to live through that. Right? God got me one time in Israel with waves of uh, love and joy, really. It was, it was fun at first, but then I didn't think I was going to live through it. And I told him that, Lord, one more wave, and I'm, I'm not going to live through it. But I did live through it. And one more wave came, and again, and again, and again. See, he doesn't come to kill you, per se, normally. He comes to fill you. And there's a transformation that happens in the inner person when the Holy Spirit comes mightily upon you. And what we do in our church is move everybody to like prayer lines so we can get at you and lay hands on you and impart that fiery presence all over the place, right? 
but all of you are called. Now here's, here's one thing that hinders people from receiving. We don't think we're holy enough or ready enough. I've seen it stop people from getting saved. And so I wish you'd have, I wish you'd have caught me a couple of years ago, but now I've been too bad. I know for sure God's not the slightest bit interested in me. I've burned up all my chances. I'm like, no, you're just the very one he's looking for right now. Same with you. It's not a performance-based thing. It is the gift of God. It's not of works. What you get from him is a gift. But you are accountable for what you do with it. But it's a gift, all right? Can you receive a gift from a loving father? I mean, we don't deserve this stuff. Can you imagine he's giving you the Holy Spirit? He wants to share himself with you on an intimate level. He wants to come and live inside of you. How could this possibly be? But it, it, it's too good to be true, but it's true. So I want you to start to breathe him in right here. Why don't we take a few more minutes and just breathe him in. you all join hands here. <laughs> not, not across the aisle, no, no. Just, just not across the aisle, but just within the row. Just join hands. And just sort of hook up, connect up. Holy Spirit, I ask you to begin to flow uh, back and forth all over this auditorium right now with your power with your amazing love just let it come fire on them fire on you in the name of Jesus let it come fill them up Lord fill, fill fire on you let your glory Go through this room. Fire on you here. Keep coming, Holy Spirit. We want to be filled, don't we? We want to be filled with all of your fullness. Lord, let it go from one to the next, to the next, to the next. In Jesus' mighty name, we want your glory to move through the room. The very best use of your time is for you to keep drinking and getting filled and filled and filled with the Holy Spirit. Please don't be afraid of this. Say, Lord, I want you. Some people miss it because they fear the counterfeit. Listen, if you ask for bread, he will not give you a stone. We're not asking for counterfeit. We're asking for God, the Holy Spirit. Come and fill us. We want to be filled. Oh, in Jesus' name. Keep drinking, keep drinking, keep drinking. Fire on you here. Let it come. Let it come, let it come. Fill her. Fill this young man. Double on him, double it. Fire on her. Fill them up, Lord. Fill them up. Fill them up. Fill them up. Fill her. Fill her. all over you, honey. 
He doesn't just empower us. You know, one of the other things the Bible says is he binds up the brokenhearted, he heals the bruised, and he sets the captives free. Because he's come to just touch you in the deep places of your heart. Will you let him do that? Fill her, Holy Spirit. Fill her up, Holy Spirit. Fill her up, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' wonderful name. Lord, let another wave of heaven go through this place right here. Another wave of heaven go through the room. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Right, it would just take forever for me to go to everybody. Let go of each other's hands. Lift your hands to heaven. Okay. The scripture says, the kingdom of heaven is within your reach. Do you believe that? Okay, then by faith, like a little kid, reach for it. Put your hands up into that invisible presence of the Holy Spirit and just get that oil all over them, that thick heavenly oil all over your hands. Get that heat on you. Get that electricity on you. Just take a moment and sort of marinate in that presence and let your hands be like an extension of the hands of Jesus. Okay, now bring your own hands down, lay them on your, on your chest or your head, and say, fire on you. Fire. And take the impartation. Lord, we ask for a mighty Holy Ghost outpouring in Youngstown, Ohio, and in this whole region for the glory of God. The takeaway from tonight's message is there is an inbreaking of the kingdom that is going to happen from time to time when you may be least expect it. But there's also a bubbling up of the kingdom on the inside of you where you can have a drink whenever you want a drink because out of your inner being now, there flows rivers, not just a little trickle or a drip, rivers of living water. The, he spoke, this, this is the spirit. There is an inexhaustible supply of the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you need a, a healing miracle of some kind? Wave at me. It could be an emotional healing. It could be a physical healing. It could be for pain. It could be for this, that, or the other, whatever it is. Listen, there's, there's very few perfect specimens. Some people need at least their cavity filled or their, uh, their, their hair thickened or their... Uh, teeth straightened or you know some blemish whatever <laughs> nothing is too small for him nor, nor is nothing too big so listen carefully the kingdom of heaven is within your reach and there's no pain in heaven there's no sickness in heaven in fact Jesus paid for that at the whipping the whipping wasn't incidental to what happened. It was all part of the plan. He took your sicknesses and carried your diseases and by his stripes you were healed. <laughs> Lift your hands to heaven once again. Get that anointing all over your hands. That healing anointing now. I don't care if you've had it for 30 years. We had a wonderful healing a couple of days ago, a lady, 30 years of pain for falling down the stairs. Just all she had to do is forgive herself for not being more careful and open the way and boom, the healing happened. 
While your hands are in the glory, just say, Lord, I forgive myself and others for in any way they contributed to my injuries or my illness or my pain and my problem. For my concussion. Somebody's concussion is being touched right here. I give you praise, Lord Jesus. Somebody's migraine headaches are being touched right here. Just tell the Lord, I forgive myself and others for any way that I blamed others. And I'm here to say that your grace is sufficient for me. Now bring your hands down, your own anointed hands, as an extension of the hands of Jesus, and lay them upon the problem as though it was Jesus himself doing it. And say this with me out loud. You ready? This healing belongs to me. Because of what Jesus has done. At the whipping and at the cross. I receive my healing now. By the Holy Spirit. As a free gift of his love. We command pain and sickness to come off God's people right now. I tell tumors to shrink, shrivel up, die, go. Lord, that kidney problem goes in Jesus' name. Those, those, those damaged knees, I rebuke that in the name of the Lord. So let fire go through those knees right here in Jesus' name. And whatever else is wrong with your blood condition, healed allergies, healed over here. Thank you, Lord. All over this room, you're moving and doing wonderful, wonderful things. Now, I want you to check yourself. Do what you could not do. If you had limited movement or if it hurt to do this or that, I want you to check yourself and do what you could not do. Bend, twist, turn, push, pull, move, whatever. And if you feel like, wow, we're, something's really shifted here, we're getting somewhere, I want you to wave at me. Just wave excitedly all over the room. Just wave your hands. If you're waving, run down to the front and let's just hear some testimonies of what's happening. What just happened, honey? So I've had pain across my low back and I wasn't able to extend backwards without any pain. Um, or move certain ways, and now I can go all the way back without any pain at all. Pain at all. And who, who was the mighty evangelist who prayed for you? That would be you, wouldn't it? Fire on her, Holy Spirit. What happened to you then? Uh, I was playing softball this Wednesday. Outfield was trying to throw the ball in, and just this pain from old baseball high school injury. It was just a sharp pain, and every time I rotated it, it felt like cartilage was missing. And now I just keep rotating it, and there's no pain whatsoever. It's just completely restored. <laughs> it's just too bizarre, isn't it? It's just like, what? Fire on him, Holy Spirit, let it come. What happened with you? I've had knee, uh, like knee pain in my right knee. I fell for the last year and a half. I've had a lot of pain. And when you told us to lay hands on ourselves, I laid my hand on my knee and I heard it pop. And the pain is gone. Yeah, my knee's fine. Did you forgive yourself? You did, see? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill her up here. Wow. What happened with you, ma'am? I've had a migraine since yesterday, and it's been lingering all day, and it is gone. Hallelujah, praise. Let it go and never return by the anointing in the name of Jesus. Woo, breathe that in right there. What happened with you, man? I fell down the step, my basement steps a couple weeks ago, and I've been really bad pain in my back and not able to sit up. I actually was going to leave because I wasn't able to be sitting there, but as soon as I stood and you started praying, and I just, whew, it's gone. I mean, I can't even feel it. And it's been agitating me all night. <laughs> and I just think Are you surprised? No, no, I'm not. No, wait, wait, wait. 
Normally we are surprised, but we're not supposed to say we're surprised. No, no, I had faith for it. But, uh, yeah. I'm always surprised, delightfully surprised when people get a healing blanket. Oh, it hasn't been bothering me. I work in a hospital, I have to pick up people, and it's been agitating. I'm just, whew. Fill her up, Daddy. Fill her up. There's more and more coming. Look at this. Wow, what happened to you, man? Well, my heel's been hurting for like almost two years, and it gets worse and worse till I had to take my shoe off, and it's hard to stand. And I've been praying over it and everything, and so you just said to stand up. I go, okay, God. And I stood up and I can do this and I couldn't do this before. I can, I'm, I'm on this heel and I couldn't walk on it. I would go out, out, out all the way from my bed to the bathroom. Jump up and down for me. <laughs> no, no, no. You could go skipping rope or something. Here. Fire on it here. What happened to you, my dear? On April 29th of last year, I was in a head-on head -on car accident. Uh, me and my mom and my knees were locked into the dashboard. And when I go back to the falls, I'm supposed to be going to the doctor for these knees and for my shoulder and, and different things. And so I'm able to, <laughs> I'm able to bend. They're popping, but they're working. You could not do that before? Difficult. Difficult days, a lot of pain. And now? It's no pain. Wow, just breathe that in right there. Stretch your hand to her, towards her and say, fire on you. Fire. What happened to you right here? <laughs> let, me, let me bring you, come on over further, guys. Have we got people on this side, or is it just this side getting it tonight? <laughs> it's your turn tomorrow night, so you guys come on back. <laughs> what happened to you? Um, I've had lupus for about three years, and I was in stage three kidney failure about two years ago. And um, just when you said that to lay our hands on it, I just like felt, I don't know for sure, but I believe. I believe that. What did you uh, feel? Like fire, like hot. <laughs> and I was shaking because it was electricity. <laughs> Let's agree with her that this is the finish of it. Okay. See, put your faith in the anointing. In the name of Jesus, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit comes on us, heals us, and fixes us. I mean, at one level, it's easy to understand, but you can like, well, how? Why? Like, what did he change what did he do i don't know he just goes in and fixes it boom and that's enough isn't it so just enjoy your healing say it with me thank you jesus for healing this young woman tell luke go in the name of jesus this she's not yours she belongs to christ jesus Right. Can I turn it over to you anytime soon, or shall we keep going? What happened to you? Um, I've had multiple head injuries. Um, actually, I was saved when I was three, and the enemies tried to kill me since then. And yeah, he hates you, you know. So how come you're still alive then? Must be God's good, yeah. God is a mighty God, and nothing's too difficult for him. And when you pray for the um, concussions, I just know that that, as well as other little things, that God's taken care of. Holy Spirit, thanks. Whew. What's happened to you, ma'am? chest breathing and knees and then my foot and when you said to lay your hands I didn't know where to lay my hands <laughs> so I went this way and just prayed that God would just go right right 
and he did because I had a heel that's been hurting and I can't walk and I took my shoe off. That's the first thing I did is I took my shoe and started walking and I didn't have no anything. And I just praised God because I just believed in him. That so you have no pain, so the physical symptoms that you can test are good. So you're in faith for the ones you can't test. Why, why can't we just make a decision we're going to believe him? Yeah. See, part of the problem in North America, the Western nations, is we've kind of had prayer several times, and you know, they're like, eh, every time you pray and it doesn't work, it just gets a little bit harder to rev up and believe. So just turn the page, and let's begin again, and realize he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think. We learned a couple of things about healing. One was to persevere in it. Because you think that uh, sometimes the quick prayer should be enough, because it was for Jesus. But in our case, I think it's fair to say we're not as anointed as he was, at least not yet. Would that be fair to say? So it might take us a little longer. But you stay with it. Uh, we had a mighty healing on, I think it was uh, Tuesday night, might have been Monday night. And it took about 15 minutes. So I prayed for the woman. She's 50% better. I turned her over to Carol, who worked with her for another 15 minutes. And totally absolutely healed. This lady was 30 years in pain and she met me the next morning and says, you have no idea how good it feels to wake up with no pain. So I often tell people, listen, it's the anointing that's healing you. Now, if you wake up in two or three days and the symptoms are trying to come back, because sometimes the enemy will contend for your healing. Don't automatically start fighting the devil. Why do I say that? Well, because we've learned, many of us as Christians, to, you know, to fight him, resist him, and all of that, and we do. But see, in, if in the doing, you treat him as though he had the power to steal your healing, then it's kind of like, according to your faith, be it unto you. So I want you to put your faith in Jesus Christ, who has who said it clearly in Matthew 28, yes. uh, verse 19, all authority in heaven and on earth and in Youngstown has been given unto me. So if he has it all, how much does that leave for the other guy? Nothing. So I want you to treat him like he's defeated, and you just, if it tries coming back, you just say, no, not having that. Jesus healed me, and then by faith, you step back into the same anointing that healed you tonight. You can even reach up, take a handful, and put it on your head, or whatever, you, whatever way you can connect with it, but just realize it is the anointing that breaks the yoke. Yeah. Byron, what happened to you? I didn't pray for knees. I just went like this, and then my friend continued to pray because I had knots on my knees and I couldn't kneel. Like a, a, a bone spur in front of my knee when I couldn't kneel and it would have hurt really bad, and it's, it's diminished. Is it totally gone? It's an itty bitty pea size. No pea size. <laughs> Off you go. The whole thing. What happened to you, young man? I suffered from depression all my life. And Jesus healed me from that. And when I was really, really little, I used to have epilepsy really, really bad. And a couple years ago, I was in a seizure. And uh, the doctors asked, 
to put me through a CAT scan, and they said you shouldn't be having seizures now. And bef not before that, I prayed while I was in the hospital for him to heal me. So you're doing really, really good. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let the anointing come on him. Why don't we give Jesus a great big thank you? There are days when I wish he was still on the earth. Because I'd give my right arm to be in a healing meeting that Jesus led. Wouldn't that be amazing? One of his meetings. But he said, I need to go away because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come. And I want the Holy Spirit to be able to come to each and every one of you. And so because he left and sent the Spirit, we can enjoy the presence just like this. But it's not for you to keep bottled up. What you do is you receive it, and then you quickly learn how to, how to give it away. And so you can pray for people at work or at school or the neighbors or wherever you go. Just say, hey, have you got pain in your body? Yeah? Say this after me. And they'll go, what? Yeah, just say this after me. This healing belongs to me. Healing belongs to me. Because of what Jesus has done. Because of what Jesus has done. I receive my healing now. See, that's important. I receive now in the name of Jesus because of what he did at the whipping of the cross. Now check yourself. Very important. Get them to check and as they do, they look at you like, how did you do that? And you're like, I didn't do that. You asked him, and he did that. And people are just flabbergasted. We, we want to teach every little anointed one to go out and bring the kingdom to a desperately broken, hurting world. Amen. Give him a big hallelujah. Big thank you. Michael, over to you. Hey, can we stand and give Jesus praise so that he knows we're thankful? Can we do that? Come on. Let's give him something. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we thank Pastor John? Come on, let's thank Pastor John. Thank you. Why don't you just lift your hands, lift your hands. Father, I thank you that these encounters continue all night long, that it will increase, that your glory and presence will increase tonight, that you'd speak to us, Lord, in dreams and visions, that there'd be encounters in the night on the way home. I thank you in advance, Lord, for testimonies tomorrow about what you're going to do tonight and what you've already done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Get here early at 9 o'clock, Lou Engle, early in the morning. See you. Bye-bye.